is I try to make them active learners. So they need to take an active role in what they're learning, in how they're learning. And by doing that, they really gain those skills. Welcome to the Please Raise Your Virtual Hand podcast. We are so delighted to dive into the exciting, challenging, and sometimes messy world of virtual learning, where nothing is impossible and redefining student success is possible. Low Country Education Consortium aims to open up new possibilities for parents, students, and our business and industry partners as we fundamentally transform learning for students. We will hold your virtual hand throughout this series where we will discuss the world of virtual learning and how we are preparing our students for college, careers, and jobs that haven't been created yet. Virtual learning may be new to you, but it's here to stay. So let's get started. I'm your host, Matt Novielli, and we have an amazing episode for you today. I'm here with our wonderful co-host, Low Country Virtual Teacher, and Pineapple Extraordinaire, Amy McKenzie. We're so excited to have you join us today on this episode, Amy. Absolutely. I'm excited, too. We're going to be taking some time to dive into her journey as an educator, look behind the scenes at what teaching is virtually, and see her reflections on the school year. Let's start off with your personal journey. I've had the chance to really get to know you and can vouch that you're an amazing teacher. You're an outstanding teacher in both the brick and mortar and virtual classroom. So tell me, what made you decide that you would make the most impact on your kids teaching virtually? That's a really great question. Um, I'd say to answer that, I'd have to go back to probably the beginning of my career. When I started teaching in the classroom, I really liked pulling in that technology aspect into my face-to-face classroom, but I felt like I wasn't doing it to its fullest potential. So I decided to go back to Coastal Carolina University, which is where I got my undergraduate degree and earned my master's degree in instructional technology. When I was getting that degree, I totally loaded up my toolbox with all these different ways to put technology into the classroom to benefit students. And I found that it was really a strength of mine and I enjoyed doing it. And so then throughout the first couple of years of my career in the face-to-face classroom, I was using technology as um, kind of like the method of my delivery of teaching. It wasn't so much about the technology itself. Technology was used to enhance what my kids were learning. And then in 2020, you know, most teachers across the world were just thrown into virtual teaching. And so being thrown into it, I found that I really thrived. I enjoyed it a lot and I was really good at it. And I really loved being a virtual teacher and from that experience of being thrown into a new environment, so to speak, I I found that I grew as a teacher. One thing that I was really able to prioritize was my relationship building. Now, don't get me wrong. When I was in the face-to-face classroom, I, I built relationships and I had a classroom community because that's something that's always been important to me as a teacher. But In the virtual world, I was able to really prioritize that because I was being purposeful about doing it. I wanted to make sure that my virtual students had a wonderful experience. I wanted to make sure that they not only felt like they were learning, but felt like they had that school experience of of making friends and doing fun things. And so because I was being more mindful about having to give my students those experiences, I found that I really became a better teacher. And so because of that, I I feel like virtual learning is the right fit for me. I think that's so important. Yeah, I love that idea that 
you kind of everybody was thrown into that virtual environment suddenly but you found out that you thrived in that and and did you yeah. find that kind of students felt the same way that some of them were like mm, you know this is not for me and some of them were like whoa i absolutely love this or what did you yeah. see when you were there Oh, definitely. Absolutely. So when we were all, you know, like I said, all the teachers were thrown into it, but all the families were thrown into it too. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I found like some kids really, you know, it opened their eyes to be like, this is my full potential. This is what works for me. And just as I became a better teacher because of the virtual environment, I feel like there are a a subset of students who felt the same way, that they really were able to be the best that they could be because of this modality of virtual learning. And that, that I think that's truly amazing that, you know, we can see that shift in the style of education. And that's awesome that you were able to build that community within your classroom while still having students that were learning to be impacted in those positive ways in the virtual environment. Now, going along with that, I want to know what are some of those biggest challenges that you face coming into the year? Okay, biggest challenges. So, um, you know, going into the 21-22 school year with Low Country Virtual, one of the biggest challenges, you know, of course, we are building this program from the ground up. So there's always going to be those, you know, logistical challenges. But I feel like as a school, as a community, we really got through it um, without too many hiccups. And, you know, the kids really hit the ground running. Um, Another challenge that I faced was that for the first time ever, I would be teaching fifth and sixth grade. So in the 21-22 school year, I taught fifth and sixth grade, where the majority of my career was seventh and eighth grade. And to someone outside of the education field, they might be like, oh, well, fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth, that's really not a big difference. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, a fifth grader is 10 or 11, and an eighth grader can be 13, 14, some of them even 15. So that's a huge difference in a child's life, being a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old. So, um, yeah, that was a big challenge for me to wrap my mind around having to to switch kind of like my style a little bit from going from those moody teenagers to those um, younger kids that are getting ready to graduate into the middle school mindset and perspective. So that was a challenge, but I I really found that I enjoyed it. Um, I had a wonderful, wonderful team of teachers that helped me through it, who were more experienced in those grade levels that I was able to rely on to support me and to, you know, give me some tips and tricks and also some resources. So that, you know, that was a challenge, but just like with anything else in, in teaching, you adapt and you, you know, you make it work. And I found that I, I really love this age group. So that was definitely, um, you know, a positive that I didn't, know that I was going to grow to love so much. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think whether you're in the business field or educational community, you know, your team is what is going to support you through stuff. So, you know, not only are you a team with the other teachers, but as a community, as a team for your classroom, you guys are helping each other grow. So then thinking back on those challenges, how did it help you as an educator grow, but the students grow as well? So it definitely helped me grow because I had to do a lot of research on what works best for that age group. Like I said, a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old, what works best for them is very different. So I had to step back and say to myself, Amy, you need to learn, you need to practice, you need to research. And so that helped me grow. But my students, I felt like, grew also because I have that mentality of teaching older kids. So I really, um, I I feel like I held them to a high standard and, um, you know, I I didn't coddle them maybe as much as some other elementary or early middle school teachers might be used to doing. So I feel like going from those 13 year olds that, you know, already have it together and are getting prepared for high school, that maturity level, I kind of kept my expectations the same for that. Now, of course, fifth and sixth graders are not going to be as mature as those eighth graders. But by holding them to a really high standards, I saw that a lot of them really, really 
rose to meet my expectations. They, they worked hard and they, you know, got serious when they had to, and we giggled and laughed when we wanted to. So, (laughs) you know, it was a fun experience. And and I think both of us really um, benefited from it. And, and one really great thing is that I will actually be teaching them again in the 22, 23 school year. So I get to loop with these kids. Wow. So that's awesome. You get to loop up and and continue work with those same kids. Yes. And so I've never done that before. I have never looped with my students before. And for anyone who's not a teacher, looping is just teaching the same group two years in a row. And, and so I've never looped before, which has its, you know, you know, challenges going into it. And it also has its benefits. But for me, I really feel like the benefits are, you know, outweighing the challenges where I, I know these kids and they know me. And so we're, we're already starting off, you know, hit the ground running, so to speak, where we know each other. We've had this relationship and this trust that we've built with each other. And so I think I think next year is going to be a really great year. Yeah. And that relationship and trust is the cornerstone of any classroom that you have. Right. Yeah, so absolutely. when you're looking at that, I think it's going to be amazing that you have that established with those students already. And not only is it just going to be those students, I'm sure there'll be other students that join the class. And by having that model and example of what the expectations are is going to be amazing to facilitate that whole expectation throughout the whole year. Um, Yeah, I've actually, yeah, I've been thinking about that. Um, It's been on my mind because, you know, when I first was like, oh, I'm looping with these kids. I was thinking, well, what about the other kids, the new kids that that I didn't teach in the previous year? Is it going to be a disadvantage for them? But really, the more I think about it, um, I feel like they're just coming into an environment where there's already a foundation of trust. There's already a foundation of caring for one another. So I feel like they are really going to um, be able to come into this new classroom in the 22-23 school year and just really meld right in like a melting pot. So I'm really excited to see the classroom dynamics and the community that I'll be able to build in that year. Oh, that's going to be amazing. And let me yeah. let me build on that with you right now. And I'm going to ask you this. What kind of tools and skills do you think that your students are going to walk away from you this year with that they didn't have coming into the school year? Oh, great question. Yeah. Um, so I look at it in two different ways. You know, obviously being a virtual teacher, I have to give my students a lot of technology skills. And throughout the year, I I try to build each quarter a new technology skill in my in my classroom. So whether that's, you know, in the first quarter, I usually start with something a little bit more user friendly, like a Nearpod or a Pear Deck. I really love Pear Deck. Um, So that builds their skills, like a little bit of being able to join a a Google Meet and also have another tab open with your Pear Deck with the lesson. Um, And then as the year progresses, I I do more interactive, more skill-driven activities like um, a Jamboard or, you know, taking interactive notes in a Google slide. And so then at the end of the year, I even build it up even more where, you know, I'll give them a Google slide and I'll say, okay, well, you need to open it. You need to make a copy. You need to share it with the four other kids in your breakout room. And so those are the technology skills and I scaffold them throughout the year. So I'm really excited next year to see some of my kids that I'm looping with being able to teach those skills to maybe some new students coming in. Yeah. And, you know, so... When we're thinking about that, all those things like the Nearpod, the Paradex, Jamboard, so those are going to be interactive materials that you use in class, and you don't come in expecting them to be masters of how to use all these interactive materials, right? So you walk them through everything. Absolutely. Everything that I do that's technology-driven, it needs to be scaffolded. You know, it needs to be chunked, and it has to be, you know, user-friendly, to the level that they're at, you know, we have to meet the kids where they're at and, you know, they need to be able to learn the technology without that interfering with them learning the content. Because at the end of the day, I don't want them to learn the technology. I want them to learn the science from me. So I can't let that technology, that virtual aspect get in the way. I need to make it enhance their learning. 
So I don't ever want to do, yeah, I don't ever want to do a lesson where the technology is just out of their grasp because technology is such an amazing tool that we can use to really enhance what our kids are learning. And so that's the purpose of it. That's amazing. Yeah. So now the other aspect of that, I think the skills that my kids have learned really, I, I work on social skills a lot with them. You know, I work on their social emotional learning so that they can grow to be citizens and grow to be well-adjusted adults um, in the not, not so far away future. Right. So some skills that I've really worked on them this year is being good friends, reaching out and making sure that your virtual classmates are your friends. Um, And I've really been working on helping them communicate with me and with one another. So that, that I think that they're going to, they're going to grow from, and they're going to bring that into the 22, 23 school year. Yeah. And I, you know what? I, I have seen that and I've had the privilege of working with you this year. So I've get to see some of those interactions between you and your students. And those are some of the most important skill sets for students in any age group to walk away with. Absolutely. We want them to be able to have those skills. And one of the biggest things, and I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out to you and see how how you like this question. But (laughs) when we look at the profile of a South Carolina graduate, right, I feel, and I'm sure there's a ton of more information that goes into this, but I think that one of the most important things is the skills of knowing how to learn and critical thinking and problem solving, right? Those are the most two sought after skills for students to achieve while they're in school. So how do you accomplish this mountainous task every year in that classroom. So you're talking to me about interpersonal skills and you're talking to me about communicating and problem solving. So how do you accomplish that? And then what do you expect from your students after they're done in your class? All right. So what do I expect? So really the way I build these critical thinking and these problem solving skills is by, and you know, this is a funny term, but not spoon feeding everything to my kids. You know, I don't want to ever be that teacher that just talks and talks and talks and talks and they just sit there and listen. So what I do and what I try to keep, you know, wrapping my mind around every time that I teach my kids is I try to make them active learners. So they need to take an active role in what they're learning, in how they're learning. And by doing that, they really gain those skills. One thing that I I like to do towards the ends of my unit, I like to do vocabulary reviews because science has a lot of vocabulary words and a lot of words that they might not use in their everyday vernacular. So we do these vocabulary review lessons towards the end of every unit. And a lot of times kids will say to me, oh, I don't remember that word. What does it mean? And I'm like, no way, buddy. You got to figure that out for yourself. And of course, I, you know, I give them the tools. I say, okay, well, I think that we learned that at the beginning of the quarter. So can you find a lesson that might have those vocabulary words? Or I say, here's the link to my website. I have those lessons posted. Do you see any lesson that you think has the vocabulary word in it? And so while, you know, that might be at the basic level because they're only 10 and 11, like I said, um, that is building the foundation for having that critical thinking and problem solving skill set that adults really need to function in day-to-day life. So, you know, I guess I would say that the best way for teachers to build those skills in kids is by making them practice it. Don't spoon feed your, your kids everything and make them practice having an active role in their own learning. That's, that's so useful just with anything in life. And, you know, having that mindset and that foundation is the integral part to, to growing up and maturing and being mindful of it and thinking about how do I learn and knowing how you learn, but then enhancing it through technology, that's going to create a world of possibilities for students. Yeah, I agree. All right. Now I want to play a quick clip of you teaching about weathering, erosion, and deposition, and how the students use some of that interactive material. I see it afterwards, so I'm gonna change to blue, and then my river's not gonna be very deep. My river's just gonna kind of be this deep. That's how deep the river goes. And then I think I need to label it because 
you guys know me, I'm not the best artist, but when I go back and I study my notes, I need to make sure I know what this means. So I'm gonna use my text box and I'm gonna make a label. Make it my text a little smaller. And I'm gonna write um, that there is a powerful river on the surface of the land. And I think that will help me remember what that is. So that was a amazing video of you walking them through a Jamboard. Can you tell us a little bit more about what was happening in there? Yeah, absolutely. So that's an example of like how I like to do lessons in an interactive way. I really want my students to be active in what they're doing. And instead of just saying, here's the definition of what a canyon is, write it down. Instead of doing that, I say, here's the definition of what a canyon is. Do you have any questions? Okay, now let's draw it. And so I model that drawing for them. So when they're looking at their computer screens, they see what I'm drawing. They draw it on their own computer screen. And then you can hear me in that clip, you know, some kids are like, oh, I don't want to draw. And drawing's really hard on the computer anyway. So um, I tell them I'm not a great artist, so I'm going to label it. And, and that's really, there's two purposes of that is because First of all, if they're not a great artist, that's okay. I'm not either. And um, sometimes our drawings look a little silly. But second, so I'm modeling that for them. You know, I'm saying it's okay if you're not great at it. And secondly, um, I want them to have that written label. I want them to make the connection between the vocabulary definition and the drawing that they made. And then you hear me say, when I go back and study this, and so that's my little hint or reminder to them to say, hey, you need to go back and study these notes, you know, eventually. So keep, hold on to this Jamboard and we'll go back and study it. And that that's one of the lessons that I do that's interactive. And I probably wouldn't do that at the beginning of the school year because it's a little bit more um, technology dependent. So that would be kind of, you know, a middle of the year type of lesson. And that's amazing because you are using that interactive notebook while you're modeling those expectations for the students. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that really helps them, you know, you know, me saying like, I'm not a great artist and me saying when I go back and study this, it, it's modeling that behavior, like you said, of, you know, this is a study tool for you. The reason that you're doing this work in class today is so that you can learn the material. You can go back and study the material. You know, the learning is on you. And so that that's a really fun um lesson that I like to do with my kids is those interactive jam boards. So I know you have talked to us about all this material and the things that you look at with the students. I want to know some of those behind the scenes things about planning your science lessons. Can you talk us through what that looks like? Where do you find material? Where do you get the information from? I'm a planner. I'm a planner in every aspect of my life. <laughs> you can ask my family, you can ask my husband, when I go on vacation, I have a spreadsheet itinerary. So planning is actually one of those parts of teaching that I love. So when I start my planning, I always start with a long range plan. And a long range plan is basically you look at your entire unit as a whole and you pace it out so that you'll be able to hit every single standard, every single indicator in a specific amount of time. And so I like to do that first to make sure that I don't rush through any of the more difficult indicators and that I don't accidentally spend too long on any of the easier indicators, because sometimes that's tempting to do when kids really understand something. It's, it's tempting to sit there and stay there because it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I like to do the long range plan first. And in every long range plan, I also add in some days where I will maybe take a break from the the standards themselves to do maybe an SEL day or a choice board day, something where kids can, can sit back and kind of not feel like they're constantly putting their nose to the grind all the time. So that's how I build my long range plan. And where I find those standards and indicators are always from the South Carolina State Department of Education website. So they have great resources on, um, 
the education uh, website where they'll have exactly your standards, then they'll have exactly your indicators and which words, which vocabulary words and which concepts you need to teach. So that's where I get my resources because at the end of the day, that's what the kids need to take away. Now, if you were to zoom in a little bit on the individual lessons, So my individual lessons, I try to make them super, super interactive. If you, if you think about it, we're teaching 10 year olds, 11 year olds, 12 year olds, and they do not have the ability developmentally. They just don't have the ability to sit and listen to someone for an hour. You know, when I was in college and I sat in my college classes, it might've been a little difficult sometimes to sit and listen to someone speak for an hour. So I need to make sure that my lessons are engaging and interactive. I mean, think of the average TikTok video. It's like seven seconds, right? (laughs) So that's what we're dealing with with these kids. You know, they, they love those, those short attention grabbing aspects. And I try to do that in my lessons. So one, one way that I do that is by requiring a lot from them. Like I said earlier, I make them take that active role in their learning. Um, a couple of a couple of things that I like to do that might make a lesson more interactive is I really engage them in the chat. So one thing I do is um, I constantly have polls set up, and a poll is basically this tool where they can vote on on the choices that you give them. And so if you constantly have them have them trying to interact with these polls, it keeps them listening. It keeps them engaged. Another, another strategy I really like during my lessons is called waterfall. And this is a really fun one. I'll turn the chat off. I'll ask a question. I'll give them maybe 15 to 30 seconds to think about their answer. And I'll say one, two, three waterfall. And then I'll open the chat and they type as fast as they can and put their answer in and you get this waterfall of answers coming in, in the chat. And so that's a really, really good one because sometimes kids are nervous that they're going to be wrong, but since there's 20 to 30 to 35 answers coming in all at once, if there's one or two wrong ones, no one notices. That's Um, awesome. And that's, that's, you know, your intentional planning about the material with that and then keeping those students engaged is, you know, essential for any classroom. Absolutely. And it's just little uh, interactive activities like that. Give me a scale of one to 10. You know, how difficult do you find this vocabulary word? You know, just like little things like that, that keep them engaged um, while you're doing the live lesson. And then, you know, in the lesson, you also need to break it up. You need to have activities for them to do. You need to have videos for them to watch, maybe sound clips for them to listen to. Um, or maybe even interactive activities like a virtual lab for them to do. So always be switching it up and always be relying on them to take an active part. So when you plan these materials, do you um, incorporate those through all your lessons? Like, so they're not just sitting there and getting that information, a lecture from you. That's going to be something that each class, they they can assume that they're going to do some sort of interactive material with you during the lesson. Oh, absolutely. Every single class, because I mean, like I said, like, think about how boring it would be to sit and listen to, to me talk for an hour. No way. Those kids don't want to do that. They want to take part in their learning. And when I give them the opportunity to take part in their learning, they step up and they always do. And it's become an expectation. So it's not a surprise when I ask them to participate. It's not a surprise to them when I'm telling them, okay, everybody needs to put their answer in the chat. It's not a surprise when I say, okay, everybody needs to make a drawing on this jam board right now because I've set that expectation and it, it's become routine for them that when they come into Mrs. McKenzie's class, they are participating, they are learning, they are the ones doing it. And that's so powerful for their learning. I mean, that circles back to exactly what we're talking about before with that South Carolina profile of graduate is to know how they learn and to have that critical thinking. And you set Mm -hmm. that environment for them. Yeah, it's all about setting the environment, right? My, My students have come to expect that from my science classes. So since they know that that's what I'm expecting from them, they do it. You know, children will rise to your expectations every time. 
Yeah. And that just like you said before, when you came in that year teaching different grade levels and you had these high expectations, the students were able to meet those, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And and I was pleasantly surprised. That's amazing. I love it. So think about this. If I'm a parent of a potential student, help me understand what they stand to gain from coming to a virtual school. Well, parents have so many options, right? You know, parents have all these options of where to send their children. There's there's public school, private school, homeschool, virtual, religious, magnet, charter. I mean, there are so many options out there, and that's a great thing. Children learn differently from each other. So, so having every child in the same exact situation doesn't really make sense. Um, I think that families need to be able to pick what works best for their family and for their children. Parents and guardians, that, you know, we can trust them to know what's best for their child, and we can trust them to be able to do the research and to reach out to their local schools, to their local virtual programs, and, and make an informed decision on what works best for their child. And we can also help guide them in deciding what is the best way for their child to learn, what is the best avenue for their family. Now, virtual school, I think, is really, really wonderful for that group of students that thrive in that environment. Now, what do we stand to gain? There are things that we can do in virtual school that just aren't available in other modalities of learning. We, ha- we have that flexibility, right? We, we have a flexibility of how our students learn and when our students learn. And that's important for a lot of parents, the how and the when. And so because of that flexibility, I'd say that's the number one benefit for someone who, who wants to be in a virtual environment. There's also, you know, other little things like, like we get guest speakers all the time because we don't have to arrange for them to travel to us. So we've got those guest speakers. We can take kids on a field trip. If, if I'm teaching about um, watersheds, I can bring my kids on a virtual field trip to, you know, someplace that has the Grand Canyon, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those virtual field trips are, are really great for our kids. We have that built-in time for small group learning, that built-in time for individual remediation. That's something that I know all of my coworkers at Low Country Virtual really, really focus on is that small group and that individual remediation. So I think think those are probably the, the biggest benefits of families choosing virtual school. And that's wonderful. And you know, as I hear you talk about that reme- remediation and, and thinking about students working in small groups. Now, you, for you personally, when you work with your students, do you see a lot of students that either need a small group for more support or do you have also students that are thriving in specific topics and you can help engage them in different ways? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's there's both ends of the spectrum. I have students that struggle on on unit number one and thrive on unit number two. So, you know, kids are, kids learn at different paces and in different ways. So I would say probably, probably 75% of my small group and my individual time is spent with students that need extra help and remediation or need to have a chance to show me that they actually do understand what I've taught them but maybe they, you know, struggled on the questions of the test. So I would say that's probably 75% of my small group or my remediation. Um, And then the other 25% is those students that are my high flyers, those students that are dying to talk to me more about what I'm teaching them, those students that you know, watch a, watch a documentary on Netflix and just (laughs) need to talk about it. And and so I'd say 25% of my small group time is for those kids that want to be challenged a little bit more, or that I've identified as needing to be challenged, needing to learn and dive deeper into what we're learning. So I I would say it's about 75, 25. That's great. And now for those 25% of the students that want to be challenged more? Do you have options for them to advance their skills in specific topics? Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, 
you know, like I was talking about with my long range plan, there's only so much time in the school year. And so because of that, sometimes I don't get to do those extra activities um, with my whole group. But for that 25% maybe of kids that really need to be challenged, really need to dive deeper, um, those are the kids and those are the situations where I'll say, well, I've got this, you know, I've got this really interesting video. I'd love to to show it to you. And then maybe we can talk about it and talk about what you, what you think, or, you know, Hey, I found this virtual lab and we can't do it in class. We just don't have enough time, but I bet you'd really enjoy it. And so I'd send it to the kids and, and they think that they're getting this extra fun <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> and really, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging them and I'm, I'm demanding more of them because they are capable. That's awesome. That's amazing. And you know, you make, a wonderful environment for your students in your virtual classroom. And I know you spend an enormous amount of time and energy behind the scenes completing all these things. And you're also one of the staples of Low Country Virtual. I'm always hearing and seeing people reach out to you looking for guidance, support. How do you accomplish this in a virtual setting? So how are you working with your with your peers and coworkers to support them? So connections are everything to me. It's really, really important. I think I've made this clear that I make connections with my students. They make connections with each other. But I feel like that also translates to my coworkers. It's it's so important for teachers to build connections and relationships with each other. Now, teachers need support. We need to support one another. And, and that goes for in whatever school that you're teaching. Teachers need to support one another. It's not an easy job to do, and it makes it much easier when you have support and those connections with your coworkers. I, I really, truly value and appreciate learning from my peers, and, and so I strive to do the same thing for them. When I started teaching, I had these excellent mentors that really valued collaboration. And so my first couple of years when I was a student teacher and my first few years in the classroom, these amazing teachers taught me that collaboration is going to make you a better teacher. And throughout my years in education, I've really worked hard to keep a growth mindset. And, and what that basically means is that I am always trying to be better than I was yesterday. You know, tomorrow is going to be better than today was. And I'm trying to grow as a teacher and I'm trying to grow as a person so that I can be better for my students. And one thing that I've really found is having this growth mindset allows me to have this philosophy where if one person succeeds, that doesn't take away from my success. So I want to help everyone that I work with to succeed. I want to record a lesson that's going really, really well so that my coworkers can see it and learn from it because I know that I want to see their lessons that go really well. I want to, when I create a document, like maybe I created a super interactive jam board. If I create that and I love it and my kids love it, I want to give that to everybody because here, you know, here's how I look at it. When I do a really great job, my, my students benefit. And when you do a really great job and you share that with me, now your students are benefiting and my students are benefiting. And that's, that's really what we all are here for, right? We're here to do what's best for the students that we serve. And so doing our best really, really depends on us supporting one another, connecting with each other and sharing with each other. So I I would say I just kind of have this drive, this growth mindset that drives me to want to help my coworkers. Yeah. And well, can I let you in on a secret then? Yeah. So we have something in Low Country Virtual that we use all the time for cases like this. And what's amazing is that we can view it and watch these at any time. So if I'm looking for support in how to create a Google document or how to create um, different types of tests for students, I have sat there and I've watched some of the things that you've created and I've used them during different parts of the year. So you may have posted that in September, but I'm going back through it in April uh, or March and I'm using that to create it. So I wanted to thank you for that because 
that is something that you continuously do. Absolutely. The pineapple chart. Yes. I love the pineapple chart. And just like you said, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things about the pineapple chart is that it's, it's professional development when you are ready to develop, right? So it's, it's learning Mm -hmm. on my own time. It's, oh my goodness, I need to figure out how to do X, Y, Z with my students. Let me check the pineapple chart. And then I check and I find, you know, just like you said, you know, six weeks ago, someone posted this exact thing that I need to grow on and this exact thing that I need to learn from. And so it's it's really, I think the pineapple chart is one of the best things for low country virtual teachers because we support each other, we learn from each other. And because of this, we are really, you know, what it boils down to is we're really helping our students grow. Yeah, and it's a whole group effort. And like you're saying, my September, October, I was running around busy trying to get all the students ready and prepared. And I noticed that this was something that you posted during that time frame. And I was like, well, I don't have time for this. I'm not looking at this right now. But now (laughs) as we're getting through the year, I'm like, wait a minute, I need some help with this. And I can just go and click that at any point. And I have a whole lesson in front of me that is walking me through step by step process. And Amy does an amazing job with this. She, I think you, there's any topic you can literally go and find and she has a walkthrough or how to set it up or some thinking questions that she can pose for you that helps you in your classroom. So that is amazing. And thank you for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do it. I really am. So, so as we start thinking about how we're helping other teachers, what kind of advice do you have for new teachers in the virtual world? So advice for a new virtual teacher, I would say one of the most important things, you know, like I was talking about with keeping a growth mindset, you can never stop learning. You know, all teachers have to be these continual lifelong learners because education is constantly changing. Children are constantly changing. And guess what? We all know technology is constantly changing. And so I would say, these virtual teachers that are are just stepping into this world and into this community, keep a growth mindset, continue to learn and reach out to your coworkers, ask them for support, tell them what you need. And then also you need to reciprocate that as well. So, you know, share what you have and, and share your resources because really when we work together, it's just we get so much more out of our jobs when we work together. We continuously learn and continuously grow. So I'd say, yeah, if you wanna if you wanna join that virtual world, then then keep an open mind and keep that growth mindset. I love it. So you know, now that we started this interview off with a personal story, I'd like to always finish with a personal story as well. So I want to expand on that right now with. What is your most memorable moment that you had this year? So it it could be one with students or staff. What stuck out to you the most? Hmm, Most memorable. I've had a lot of a lot of memorable moments in the 21-22 school year. It it was a great year for me. And I've I've really loved my group of students that I had. I love my coworkers um, in, in that year. It was just it was fantastic. If I had to choose just one. Just I one. would say, yeah, just one. <laughs> I would say the talent show. So, um, oh yeah, I, yeah, I loved the talent show. I it was really a work of heart. It was, you know, something that I worked so hard on. And and I'll just give our listeners a little background. Basically, how this happened was, <laughs> I have in my homeroom we do Tuesday talks, and every Tuesday. I give them a different question and they make a flip grid where they, you know, tell me something. And one Tuesday I had a student say to me that she um, was working really hard to win this art competition. And I never, I didn't even know that she was an artist. And I said that to her, I said, you've never told me that before. I didn't know you were an artist. And so, and so that was like a learning experience for me. And I was just like, I need to showcase this. And so I brought it to my team. I brought it to the other three teachers on my team. And I said, what do you guys think about doing a talent show? I promise I'll do all the hard work. I'll, I'll organize it and I'll, I'll get all of the, you know, submissions and I'll plan everything, but are you guys on board? And of course I have the best coworkers. They were like hundred percent. Yeah, we're, we're definitely on board. You know, let us know what we can do to help you. 
And so the more we spoke about it, the more we said, "Mm, we should not keep this to ourselves. And so we brought it out um, to the rest of our community in Low Country Virtual. And we said to some other teachers, do you guys want to do this? And, and, you know, it's not surprising because we have a wonderful community, but everybody jumped on board. Everybody was like, yes, this is awesome. Go for it, Amy. Like you can do it. And so I, you know, I spent a lot of time, which is probably what makes it very memorable for me, but I spent a lot of time organizing it, getting it together through all different grade levels. I mean, we had students from kindergarten to eighth grade participating. And so I put this all together and the way that it worked is we had grade level talent shows and the winners of those went on to the school level talent shows. And so, yes, it was a personal accomplishment for, for me to be able to organize this and, and to get it, you know, up and running. But the most memorable part, I have, I have goosebumps just thinking about it. When we did the talent show, our students really made me just so proud the way that they were interacting with each other. They were talking in the chat about, you know, just, just really building each other up, being so supportive of one another. Every single performer that went on had at least, you know, I'd say probably 15 to 20 comments in the chat about how amazing their performance was. Not a single negative comment, just just love and support and community pouring out from these students. And like, I have goosebumps thinking about it right now because I was just so proud of our low country virtual kids. It was, it was a great experience for me. It was. And I I was able to sit back and watch that evolve as you introduced it to the other teachers. And then as it trickled down to the students and it, and it really was amazing because to this day, and you probably don't know this, but to this day, I still have students in my class that say, oh, Kristen did a wonderful job with that art Aww. when she did her talent show. So she can do the art piece for here. And when Kevin Aww. was talking about this, he was doing his video pre- presenting, and I think that he should be our commentator. So they use those skills that you introduce to them throughout their lessons. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with me. That like, It's things like that that really make it... Um, make it meaningful for me. Like I said, so much went into that talent show in the behind the scenes. And I can't say that it was all me because I did enlist the help of one teacher from every um, grade level to help me with all the organizing of that. So it definitely was not a solo effort, but it was a lot of work for me and those teachers to put it together. And knowing that it made a lasting impact on our students, that, that really makes it worth it. It, it was amazing. And Amy, thank you so much for letting us get to know you better. If you're interested in learning more about Amy, you can follow her on Twitter at, at Miss McKenzie. That's at underscore MRS underscore M C K E N Z I E underscore. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure you follow Low Country Virtual's Twitter at LC Virtual School because we're always sharing the inspiring things that Amy and all of our amazing teachers are doing within our community. This podcast is written, hosted, edited, and produced by a team of educators from the Low Country Education Consortium. Amy, Caitlin, Matt, and Meg are proud to bring you Please Please Raise raise Your your Virtual virtual hand. Hand.